Hi there. So in this special video, we're going to be talking about special relativity. This isn't needed for anything that you're going to do on the CIE courses. Um, it is covered on a few courses now. I think AQA have just introduced it, and it's certainly covered on IB and some USAP courses. Um, but this isn't needed for anyone if I teach you, um, but it is interesting. So we're going to look at the uh, fundamental principles behind special relativity. Um, I'll touch briefly on the equations and effects it produces. Um, but mainly I'm going to be thinking about the weirdness of it. So, there's a question you can see in front of you there. Um, the idea that you're on a train travelling at 10 metres per second. So we're moving to the side of this train. And I want you to imagine that while you're on that train, you throw a ball towards the front of the train. Um, and you throw the ball at 5 metres per second. And the question is, and it's a deceptively uh, simple sounding question, how fast is that ball really travelling? So if we just imagine that we had me travelling this way at 10 metres per second, and the ball travelling that way at 5 metres per second, well, a lot of you would be tempted to say, well, therefore, it must be 10 plus 5, so that is 15 metres per second. But the fundamental problem of special relativity is, to me, when I look at that, I see it travelling away from me at 5 metres per second. So what is the true speed of the ball? Well, that's what we're going to try and cover today. So we're going to start thinking about the weird world of relativity. And these are some of the things that you may have heard of in the media before, or um, if you've seen the film Interstellar, this takes a lot of things on there. Um, if you're on a space journey near the speed of light and you leave people on Earth, you're actually going to be younger than them when you land. If you fell towards a black hole, um, you'd actually watch the universe around you. You'd see stars born and die as you fell in. Um, if you're moving really fast towards the Earth, you'd actually see evolution happening. And if you could travel back faster than the speed of light, you'd theoretically travel backwards in time. There are loads of other things as well about lengths getting longer and shorter, and just very strange things that seem to happen as a, as a recurrence of this, or a reason for this. So if we go back to my earlier question, I was asking you about this idea that I'm on a train. So let's imagine that there's the ball, and I throw the ball away from me at 5 metres per second. But my train is travelling at 10 metres per second. So what we need to do is we need to come up with this concept of inertial reference frames. So it helps to think about, well, what about if I am standing on the side of the tracks away from the train and I'm looking at what's happening? If I do that, then I, in my inertial reference frame, as somebody that's standing on the side of the tracks, I will see the train and the ball together having a velocity of 15 metres per second. So I will observe the train travelling at 10 metres per second, and I will observe the ball travelling at 15 metres per second. But let's think for a second. You know, we, in, in this question, I would have assumed that the train is moving, and I'm this person, this version of me, is standing still. But of course, this version of me is stood on the Earth. Um, and the Earth is rotating and moving through the solar system at approximately 3 kilometres per second. And if we consider my reference against another galaxy, well, we're moving apart at about 8 times 10 to the 7 metres per second. And which one's right? Because I know that the Earth is definitely moving. So really, if I go back to this train, should I say that actually the train is moving at 15 metres per second plus 3 times 10 to the 4 metres per second? It can quite quickly get kind of impossible to, to sort of unpick these things. Um, and it's where people start to get really, really confused with why physics works the way it does at, at all. So what we do as physicists is we define an inertial reference frame with a set of coordinates. In other words, if you think about Cartesian coordinates, it's where we say zero is. And once we have that zero, then we make anything else that's a vector, because you know a vector is always just a measure of something with magnitude and direction, well, we make everything else relative to that origin. 
So I can pick and I can say if I want a vector going that, that way, it's going up and to the right relative to this zero point. What we discovered though, what Einstein postulated at least, was two things. One, he said that the speed of light has the same value, um, which you know as C, in all directions and in all inertial reference frames. And more fundamentally than that, he said that the laws of physics are going to be the same for all inertial reference frames. So what that means is, well over here I had my inertial reference frame um, as defined at this origin, but we can say, or we can postulate at least, what about if I say, well, let's have a new reference frame. Let's take this direction as zero. Well, now, instead of going away from my zero point, which it was before, it's now traveling, well, with a component that's traveling towards and a component that's traveling away. And the whole point of inertial reference frames is that the, the red one isn't special. The green one is just as valid, and we should see that all bits of physics behave in the same way. So what does that mean? Well, this comes down to a really famous experiment called the Michelson-Morley experiment. Um, and at the time, there was a belief that the universe had a particular fixed reference point. So if we imagine the Earth moving this way, um, we were thinking, well, let's measure the speed of light along the Earth. Um, and it's a really simple experiment. Um, what you have basically is a tube, um, and when light goes down that tube, you start a timer when it leaves, and you stop the timer when the light arrives. Obviously, you need very fast timers, and there's a couple of clever things they did, but that's effectively what they did. They said, well, let's run the same experiment again, but this time, let's use light that's traveling uh, at the at right angles to the Earth. And by doing some clever things, you can, um, you can account for that. Lots of people come up with um, ideas for why this wouldn't work. So you can do this using sunlight. So you can use the actual light from the sun traveling this way and do it. Um, and the kind of explanation that you might get, and the, and the one that seems um, intuitive to you, is we should get two different uh, observations. We should see that um, in this case, we should just get that the observed velocity is equal to the speed of light, because it's just traveling um, along my experiment tube, say. Um, but when I measure light in this direction, I should get the speed of light from this previous answer plus the velocity that the Earth is traveling at. So in other words, if I measure the light in one direction, I should get one speed. If I measure it in the other direction, I should get a different speed. But what we actually saw in this experiment was that they were both exactly the same. So it didn't matter what orientation you put something. However you try to measure the speed of light, the speed of light is always exactly the same. And that's weird because it starts to give us some very strange things. So let's go back to my train. Instead of, instead of throwing a bowling ball, let's imagine that I shine a light. Well, what you would have been expecting is that for, is that for me, I should in here see the speed of light traveling at three times 78 meters per second away from me. But if we think about the bowling ball again, well, this me standing at the side of the train tracks I should see the speed of light as being 3 times 10 to the 8 plus 10 meters per second. But I don't. I see it as 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second again. And that was what the Michelson-Morley experiment was showing. Um, if you imagine that the whole Earth is being used as your train, we found that doesn't matter what direction the train is going or how fast it's going, the speed of light is the same. So, this starts to cause us some really, really strange problems. So let's think about Mr. Roland, Mr. Roland and Miss Deacon. They're both on their two ships. So Miss Deacon is on the top ship, Mr. Roland's on the bottom ship. And they're having a really bad day because there are two events. And I'm going to call them Event Blue and Event Red. 
Um, and both of their ships are hit simultaneously by an asteroid. And it gets even worse, they're actually hit by two asteroids, one at the front of each ship and one at the back of each ship. Now, Miss Deakin has relative velocity to Mr. Rowland. So, in a particular inertial reference frame, we can say that Miss Deakin's ship is traveling with, uh, following this vector, so it's got velocity moving to the right. Now, actually, there's not, there's, that's not the only way we can say it. We could say that in Miss Deakin's frame of reference, she's staying absolutely still, and Mr. Rowland would be moving towards the left. But in this experiment, we're going to say it's, it's that way around. So, Mr. Rowland, in his reference frame, he's stationary. So, knowing that the speed of light has to be the same for all observers, we can say that the light will take a certain length of time to go from the back of the ship, where blue happened, and from the front of the ship, where red happened, and they'll meet in the middle here, because Mr. Rowland is stood dead centre of the ship. And in fact, so was Miss Deacon. So both Miss Deacon and Mr. Rowland were stood in the middle of their ships. So he can say, absolutely with certainty, that they both clearly happened in the same time. But for Miss Deakin, well, her ship has moved forwards in that time. So for her, because she sees the speed of light as the same, the distance travelled between where blue came from and where red came from because of this fundamental rule that the speed of light has to be the same for all observers, she's going to see light travelling the same distance from each one. Now, because she herself is here, that means the light from the red event will reach her first. So she's going to think, oh god, I've been hit by a meteorite. And then later, at a different time, she's going to detect the blue event. And this causes a problem of simultaneousness. So, from Mr. Rowland's reference point, he definitely saw them hit at the same time, but from Miss Deakin, she definitely saw them hit at different times. And what we find from this is this uh, fundamental weird result of relativity, which is if any two observers are in relative motion to each other, they won't, in general, agree about whether something happened at the same time, or whether they were as simultaneous. And generally speaking, if one person thinks that they happened at a certain time, the other one will think that they didn't happen at the same time. And what this leads us to is the idea that simultaneous simultaneity? Simultaneousness is not an absolute concept. Things don't absolutely happen at the same time, but instead it's a relative concept. Sometimes things happen uh, or whether they happen at the same time depends on who's watching them and how they're moving compared to something else. Now, a bit of a health warning, we're going to get into some maths here. Uh, but let's just think about the relativity of time. So, I have a uh, light source and a mirror. And what I'm going to do is fire light from my light source and detect it again. And I'm going to measure the time between them. Uh, that light leaving, so I'm going to start a clock when the light leaves, and I'm going to stop the clock when the light comes back. So, pretty simple, the difference in time should be twice the distance divided by the speed of light, because it's got to go there and back. So let's see what happens when I introduce some relative motion then. Let's say that I'll do the same experiment again, but this time my detector and receiver are moving as I go from one to the other. Now, the time taken will this time be 2L over C. So the distance travelled, we can just use Pythagoras, um, and if you work through it, I'm not going to go through it quickly in the video, but um, you can pause this and sort of follow through each step. Um, if I do some Pythagoras and rearrange it, this gives me the distance that the light has had to travel. And I know from previous uh, work that the time taken will be this. Now, the whole point is, because the speed of light should be the same for all observers, it shouldn't matter, or this, this delta t should be the same. So, again, because we know from the Michelson-Morley experiment that, assuming this is one long mirror, um, the speed of light is going to be observed to be the same for everyone, 
the time taken is still 2d over c. So I've now got two different equations that I can do here. I've just rearranged it to get d. And I'm left with these. If I plug them into each other, then I get this. If I simplify the equations, I get to here. Now, what we do often in physics is we make a fudge factor, or we make something that makes life easier. So this is um, the Greek letter gamma that I've just drawn. Um, and to make my life easier, I'm going to say, well, let's let there be a factor called gamma that is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c. Um, and in special relativity, we call that the Lorentz factor. So that makes it quite easy because now I've done all the horrible math, so I can forget that I had to do it. And instead, I can just say that the time taken for something to happen is equal to the Lorentz factor multiplied by uh, the time that it would take in a stationary reference frame. So the time it takes something to occur actually depends on that thing's velocity. Um, and the time is always larger than the time t0 that it would have taken had the object been at rest relative to the observer. And again, there's nothing special about that. It just means that if I'm not, if the two objects are moving together, so there's no relative motion, then it would have taken time t0. But be, if one of them is in motion and the other one isn't, they will observe it as taking this time. And the big thing to get your head around here is that it's not that t0 is the real time and t is the observed or the fake time. They're both absolutely true. And all the physics bears out that they will actually, that they're, they're both correct. They both are the time taken. So we call t0 the proper time, but it's not the real time. It's just the time that would have been observed in a stationary reference point. So we can do some other weird things. So let's say that me and Mr. Presswitch, we want to see how far apart these two signs are. So I could say, right, I know how fast I'm going, and I'm going to measure the time it takes me to, from crossing one, one uh, sign to the time it takes me to cross the other one. And then I can just use uh, distance to speed over time. Mr. Presswitch could say, well, I'm just going to go and get a tape measure and walk from one to the other. So the distance between them is at rest relative to Mr. Presswitch. So he can call that the proper length because he is at rest. He can be holding his tape measure and look at it, and that will be, um, he's not moving, so there's no relative motion. Now, he's going to notice that I'm moving relative to these signs. So I'm going to have a Lorentz contraction on my... Um, uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm going to notice um, a different time. So um, the time taken for me will be the proper length divided by my velocity. Or we can say that the, um, uh, the proper length is my velocity multiplied by the time it takes me. Now, the time that he's measuring me do it, going from one sign to the other, that can't be the proper time because I'm moving relative to Mr. Presswitch. So if we say Mr. Presswitch could try and time me, he could say he's going to start a timer as I cross the first sign, he's going to stop the timer as I get to the other sign. Well, he's not going to observe the proper time because if we go back to this definition, we said the proper time is the time it takes something to occur had, it, had they both been at rest. So, what we have to do is say, I can find the proper time, therefore for me, the length is this, and we're going to find that we're going to disagree. I get a uh, proper time and an observed length. Mr. Presswitch is going to get a proper length, but he's going to get an observed time. Now, if I plug those into an equation, what I get is some Lorentz contractions going on again. If I rearrange this a little bit, I find um, from using this that um, lengths, or the, um, the, the observed length, is equal to the proper length 
divided by the Lorentz factor. Now, if I, if you, again, I don't really have time to go through this in the video, but this is always um, greater than, or, that's not how you do a greater than, this is always greater than or equal to one. Um, so I'm always dividing by bigger numbers. So that's why we say in special relativity that we tend to have Lorentz contractions. In other words, distances that we measure tend to get shorter. Um, we have a proper length, which is if you're stationary compared to the, the distance that you're measuring. But if I'm moving relative to the thing I'm trying to measure, I'll actually observe it as being shorter than it really is. So these are the three kind of equations that form the fundamentals of special relativity. And if you go and, uh, like I say, look at other examples, these are kind of the three that you need. Time gets longer and lengths get shorter. And this depends on your velocity. So this is the velocity of the uh, observer. Uh, and that should be over c squared as well, I think, pretty sure. Check it yourselves, but I think that should be over c squared. Um, so if you look at this equation, obviously nothing can ever travel faster than the speed of light. Um, so this will always give you a number of slightly greater than 1. Um, and the faster you go, though, the larger your Lorentz factor becomes. So what's the point? Why do we bother with this? Well, this has a couple of real life implications. Um, for one thing, the clocks on GPS satellites, they have to run at different times, so they don't go out of sync with Earth. That's also to do with general relativity, which is how uh, gravity also affects time, and it gets very strange. Uh, but there's, um, there's a cool thing that we see. If we fire short-lived particles called muons um, through the space, and also through cancer therapy as well, um, what we find is that because they um, are traveling so fast, these particles should decay um, in a, uh, they should decay before we receive them. So basically I fire them from here, detect them here, um, they should have all decayed by the time they get here. But I find that they don't. And the reason that they don't is from the particles point of view, they view the distance between, between these, uh, where they're produced and where they're detected as smaller. Um, and they see that because they have a Lorentz contraction in terms of their distances. And all sorts of weird and wonderful things also come out of this. So you can go down lots of rabbit holes explaining. Um, but alas, we are out of time for this one. Um, as I say, do go back and feel free to pause the video, um, go back over some of the uh, areas that got a bit weird or through some of the maths. Um, but that is the basics of special relativity. It comes down to this rule that the speed of light should be the same for everyone, and indeed all physics should be the same for everyone. And once we start accepting that and we follow that through to its natural conclusions, we get things that on the face of it make no sense at all. But we can absolutely prove with experiments and we see in our real life world as well. Weird.